First of all, this afternoon, um, I'm Joe Bell, and I'm the moderator for um, this panel. And I would like to welcome you to the NRTRC Tau Virtual Conference. Um, we are so excited to have so many participants, and we are just glad that you could join us um, today. The conference uh, started yesterday and continues to tomorrow, so make sure you um, see what all we have to offer and participate as much as you can. Um, I also want to thank all of our sponsors. They're listed at the bottom of the screen. Um, we do have an additional one that uh, didn't make it on the screen. That's Jot Form Coronavirus uh, Responder Program. So they are one of our sponsors as well. And we really appreciate appreciate all of the support that they have provided for us um, to present this program to you. Um, some information for, um, for the day. Um, the audio and video are muted for all of the participants. Um, so you can use the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen um, to bring forward questions and we will have a question and, um, and answer session at the end. Um, I will be reading the, the questions um, to the um, program. And, um, and then when the program is all over, the presentation slides will be posted as well as the questions and answers um, that are, are given. So to get us going right away, I wanted to quickly introduce our presenters. Um, Ron Emerson, he is Global Director of Strategic Development for AMD uh, Global Telemedicine. And Dr. Wasim Gannon, uh, CEO and co-founder of Telehealth Solutions. So I'll turn it over to um, Ron. All right, thank you very much, I appreciate it. So um, first thing is I'm just gonna uh, share my screen here and just bear with me for one moment, please. And then Dr. Ganim, I'm gonna give you, uh, um, I'm gonna give you control as well before we start, we'll just get that out of the way. Okay, so we should be, we should be all set. Um, so first of all, um, good afternoon, everyone. I just want to thank you for taking times out of your busy schedules, especially with everything going on in the world and um, um, for those of us in the, uh, the medical field. Um, really excited today to uh, co-present with um, Dr. Wasim um, Ganim on something that's, uh, I think, very near and dear to a lot of our hearts, of course, which is telehealth and the, uh, um, um, the skilled nursing facilities and um, how that's impacting. And we have a real expert on the line with us today, Dr. Ganim, who's providing telehealth services to literally hundreds of these different organizations. So uh, my background is I'm a nurse. Um, I, back in the day, actually, uh, um, way, way long ago when skilled nursing facilities was not an originating site for Medicare, I used to run a telehealth network and we actually worked to provide data through the Office for Advancement of Telemedicine in my home state, Maine, in very rural areas. Um, um, which was presented and, and um, um, which was, of course, part of the contribution of getting skilled nursing facilities as originating sites. Um, but Dr. Uh, Ganim is going to talk about some, some different models of um, sustainability and, and how to um, implement telehealth in the skilled nursing facility and lung care um, term, uh, setting. So um, main objectives today, um, uh, of course, when we look at the different things that need to be considered when developing a telemedicine program, um, part of it is the, uh, the financial um, case. And uh, do, um, Dr. Ganim is going to uh, help us understand the new CMS mandates under quality-based care, um, PAM, and imposes penalties. Um, he's going to talk about that. Going to talk about the clinical benefits of implementing telehealth in the post-acute care facilities, skilled nursing facilities, and how it positively affects patient care. And then reimbursement again, going back to that. And then um, how the long-term care facilities and hospitals are successfully working together to improve patient care. Uh, and their bottom lines. And then we're also going to touch on, um, due to the time, as um, Dr. Ganim has personal experience of working in some uh, skilled nursing facilities that have been unfortunate enough to, to um, um, been exposed and having to deal with the COVID-19. So we're going to talk about the use of telemedicine and um, long-term care sniffs um, um, to, for the COVID-19 response. So saying that, um, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Dr. Ganim. And it's all you, Dr. Ganim. All right, thank you so much, Ron, and thank everybody for your time today. So my name is Dr. Ganim, co-founder, CEO of Telehealth Solution. Um, we've been in telemedicine now for nearly, um, we're about to close on our, almost our fifth year, which may not seem like a lot, but in the world of telemedicine, it means that you are a veteran of the industry, if you will. So kind of a little bit here, we're going to first discuss prior to all the the COVID crisis, if you will, one of the biggest factors in telemedicine, especially in the post-acute care market, has been 
hospital reductions or return to reduction in return to acute uh, un, or unplanned visits, ER unplanned visits. And so what that simply means is, you know, for those who are in the post-acute care sectors, anytime you have a patient who returns to the hospital within 30 days for any reason, and if they're admitted, can count as a return to hospitalization or a readmission. And currently, uh, up until uh, early last year now, Medicare has now started to penalize for these readmissions in what's called the Protecting Access to Medicare Act, and we'll get into that here in a moment. But of course, where telemedicine's big value is, or what it has provided, especially in the post-acute care market, is being able to assess, manage, treat patients in place via telemedicine platform and trying to prevent patients who uh, would return uh, otherwise for an unplanned, uh, unplanned return to hospital. Let me move, change this. So readmissions in rural hospitals, I mean, there are currently studies that show approximately 37% higher risk of unplanned in comparison to those with urban settings. I get asked about this a lot, and folks ask me, why do you think that happens in the rural settings more so than in the urban settings? It's tough to tell. I, I, I have seen, and I guess this is antidotal, is, you know, in your rural settings, a lot of times it might be only one primary care provider who's taking call, and, you know, a lot of times those folks... Um, it's a little bit of a challenge, if you will, because you're asking that provider in essence to be available 24 seven in essence. And so that's why you might see a little bit of higher return to hospitalizations in the rural settings. Um, I think Ron included here a few of the resources. Um, let's see, I don't know why this. From current, there we go. So one of the big things that I get to talk about when I go across the country and I meet with skilled nursing facilities and post-acute is if we took a bucket, if CMS looked at all of the causes for return to hospitalizations, really there's five diagnoses that encompass about 80% of those. And I'm always, you know, very, uh, I enjoy when I get to meet with skilled nursing facilities and I ask them, I'm like, so tell me, do you have Lasix? And everybody says, of course we do. Well, do you have solumedrol or prednisone? Yes, we do. Do you have IV fluids? Yes, we do. Do you have Levaquin or Rocephin? Yes, we do. And I say, well, congratulations. Those five drugs take care of about 80% of return to acuity or return to hospitalizations. As you can see right there, those five conditions really encompass 80% of the return to hospitalization causes. And so kind of I tell the, um, when I get to meet with nursing homes across the country, as I say, you have the tools to, to put these, to, to manage the patients. You really just need the tools now. You just need the driving force or captain of the ship in order to manage and treat and triage these patients. I mean, quite honestly, when I, um, you know, speak with nursing homes across the country, it's, it's a Dr. X, Y, or Z doesn't like to be called in the middle of the night or, um, you know, it's a, I'm only taking call for Dr. XYZ. I don't know anything about the patient. Please send them out to the hospital. And so that's where you'll find a lot of avoidable hospitalizations. Why is return to acute or return to hospitalizations a big deal? Obviously, you've got the PAMA penalty, which is the 2% readmission penalty. That's number one. Quite honestly, a lot of our clients also, if you're, whether you're in an ACO or hospitals, what they're building out is what's called a narrow network status. Those who have lower return to acuity or return to hospitalizations, they're usually kind of, in, kind of on a, what we would call a tier one status where they would get, you know, patients more promptly from the hospital or patients who are, have less comorbidities. Um, and so they end up being much, they end up having a much higher occupancy rate than an organization who has a return to hospitalization rate in the high 20s or low 30s. So there is a financial impact to having a lower return to acuity rate. The PAMA penalty, if you will, where, again, I, I know this was a big thing last year and it's continued now with COVID. Obviously, it's um, a little point for discussion, but again, it's 2% of withholdings and then demonstrating or a redistribution of those withholdings to uh, skilled nursing facilities who are demonstrating a reduction in return to hospitalizations. That's really a, a big facet, if you will, of the PAMA penalty. Um, again, here, SNFs with the highest ranking receive the highest incentive payments, and those with the lowest ranking receive the lowest incentivized payments. 
you know, CMS anticipated about 40% of SNPs will, re will be reimbursed less than the prepayment of penalties. When you're looking in a PDPM world, um, higher acuity means higher reimbursement, certainly. And so, you know, telemedicine opens up a forum. You, we've got clients who are leveraging our platform and doing telepulmonology. We've got clients who are doing teleinfectious disease. We've got clients in Oklahoma. We just started one today where they're doing telecardiology. So that's now bringing a lot of different acuities, if you will, or different specialties into that particular home setting. A couple of vignettes here I, for my friends who are in post-acute, we probably know this vignette pretty, pretty vividly. You know, you have Mrs. Smith, she's 86 years old. She just came to your facility. She had a recent stroke. She comes in with a peg tube because she can't swallow from her stroke. Of course, it's Saturday, three in the morning. Now she's spiking a temp of 103. Her respiratory rate's 26, pulse ox is on 80. And almost 10 out of 10 times, I'm willing to bet that if you call an on-call provider, the answer is going to be, Send them to the ER. And so, I don't know why I keep losing this slide. Let's see here, guys. There we go. And so the answer would be send, them, send that patient to the ER. Patient now has an EMS bill. Now they're gonna go to the ER. They're gonna get admitted. That nursing home's gonna get penalized. But really the biggest thing is, it's pretty traumatizing to move a cognitive, cognitively impaired senior patient to the ER in the middle of the night. I used to practice hospital medicine. That's where you start seeing your patients being agitated, pulling IVs because you've moved them to an unfamiliar surrounding. In addition, it's a large cost on the entire healthcare spectrum. So how would a treat in place model work? You know, your nurse, your patient, that same vignette, nurse feels that this patient needs to be evaluated, puts a page out through the app. Um, that goes to one of our doctors on call who then says, let me use our equipment here. We use our equipment, the equipment which Ron will show you has up to 40 different modalities, but for what we would need, we'd have two way video, stethoscope, EKG if necessary, pulse ox, um, audio. You assess that patient. You make a treatment plan in place. The treatment plan, if you will, for an aspiration event would be NPO, uh, so maybe some IV fluids, some chest X-ray, a KUB, CPC, some antibiotics via the PEG tube, um, some nebulizing therapy if needed, and certainly calling the family, letting the family know uh, what you're doing on behalf of that patient over at the nursing home, and certainly letting the PCP know in the morning of what you've done for their patient overnight because you never want to exclude the PCP from the equation. You want that PCP to be involved and continue the baton of care. Some of the collaborative marketing, this is just things that we've done with our different organizations across the country to help them and optimize them in a narrow network and in a, uh, you know, in a competitive marketplace, showing families when they're doing on-site visits as to what that community is doing differently than other communities in the area. A little bit of the benefits, if you will, during the COVID crisis, we've been extremely busy in the Northeast region right now, given COVID is particularly hit hard over there. Um, clinical coverage while isolating, a prime example. Let's try to minimize here how many patients, how many people go in and out of this patient's room. So we had one building where it started with a physician assistant and that physician assistant was sick or was positive and showed up to the nursing home and then subsequently later, um, three quarters of the nursing home's been infected, to be honest. And so this is an opportunity where with proper equipment maintenance, we were, we've been able to round on patients who are positive with COVID-19 and minimize you know, providers getting sick in person. We've had several providers. We had a provider in Kentucky and a provider in Wisconsin who were sick and could not physically go into the building anymore and round and prior to lockdown, if you will. I mean, another benefit of COVID-19 telemedicine has been the ability to have specialist lay eyes on patients, infectious disease, um, opening up the platform so that these patients can see their specialists as well and not miss a cardiology appointment. Um, but it's, uh, so you certainly have the COVID positive patients, but then you have your nursing home residents who are not COVID positive 
but they have chronic conditions that need to be assessed, but with the building being under lockdown, they cannot get this evaluation that they otherwise would. So that's another benefit, if you will, of during the COVID crisis was, you know, having that cart to be available. We've also been doing remote rounding on patients, which allows us to follow these patients longitudinally. Again, expanded coverage here. Um, you know, we used to have um, rural sites being billable sites and then urban sites being non-billable and CMS has pretty much dropped that all together. And so now all sites are treated the same. Um, this was temporarily waived. I currently think with the way the ROI has been shown with telemedicine and the response to it, I don't think this will be a temporary waiver. I think this will end up being a permanent thing because the era and the, the era of telemedicine has arrived and it's, you know, in current situational national crisis during a pandemic, many provider groups, whether it be in the nursing home or outside of the nursing home, have had to rely on telemedicine, if you will. So I'll turn this back over to Ron um, for, uh, in order for us to kind of stay on time here. All right, thank you very much. Um, let me just restart the slideshow again. Yeah, I apologize, Dr. Gann. I don't know why this thing's, uh, it's being a little squirrely on us here. So can everyone see that okay? Um, I'm just gonna go over very quick. Uh, I'm not gonna cover much time. Uh, I'm not gonna take much time on this. I just wanna go over a few things. So I, I, I know everyone has been in this conference for a few days. We might still have a few people that are new here. When we talk about telehealth in general, we, we, we recognize that it's a transfer of electronic medical data. And that can mean a lot of different things. It can mean store and forward. Um, you know, what we're really talking about in skilled nursing facilities at work, as, as Dr. Ganim said, is it's really about sort of what we call diagnostic real-time telemedicine at the top there. It's about the clinician being in a specific area, a hospitalist like Dr. Ganim, having that live interaction on one side and then being able to use appropriate medical devices where they can actually look at the patient, look at the malaise, look at their um, actual overall clinical presentation but then they have the ability for diagnostic capabilities on the side. So they can use stethoscopes, they can use um, handheld cameras, otoscopes, um, even the non-visual components like 12 VDKGs, and you can actually plug into these same units over 40 different medical devices. So it's very robust when you look at scalability and how these things work out modular these days, um, so you can cover, cover a lot of telemedicine services. Um, um, I think most folks know about store and forward. Uh, this is more for the home. And then this is um, basically the direct side. Uh, let's just talk a little bit more about SNFs. And uh, you know, um, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Ganim on the call with us. He's probably more experienced than anyone um, as far as providing uh, um, telemedicine. I'd, I'd, I'd bet on that in skilled nursing facilities uh, around the country. I'm licensed in many states and that's what he does full time. Is, is he's on constant calls with skilled nursing facilities and treating people in place. And, the technology. So uh, as, as was said earlier, sort of the standard setup that they use, which has been very useful, is they have a camera on top. Um, they can use a camera. They have a, a camera that they can use like a handheld camera. Uh, they have a stethoscope. And then they also have a 12 lead EKG. That's sort of their standard setup. Um, of course, because the facility already has O2 pulse oximeters and things such as that. Now, if that facility decides they want to use, and one of the really cool things um, that we find with this is it's not just about having someone like um, Dr. Gann and his company that will come in after hours from like say seven at night till seven in the morning and weekends to provide care, but it's also um, opening up that technology for local specialists to be able to come in and provide clinical services. And that's where you can add a lot of different medical devices, everything from dental cameras to, um, um, to spirometry, to um, ultrasound, vaginal ultrasound, um, vascular ultrasound, abdominal ultrasound, um, ophthalmoscope. So you can put a lot of different devices on these same technologies. So depending on how robust your program is and how many specialties that you want to bring in, um, you're able to do you're able to do that. Okay, um, and um, I'll let Dr. Gannon talk a little bit more about this. But they basically developed, you know, the whole thing is is you look at scale. In organizations, you know, how do you actually do this? It's really about the process of a notification reporting systems and then the integration into when appropriate into the electronic health record to maintain the standard workflow that the organization is actually using. So from a nursing staff, um, they can actually put something in, it'll notify um, Dr. Ganim that based on the clinical presentation and information they have, they can provide the appropriate level of care or contact based on the intent of that interaction with the patient regardless of where they're at. 
and then they can prevent, they can provide reports um, for visit the primary care physicians administrative staff uh, and the actual dates of the service so they can track the benefit and what's actually been done besides the daily interaction that um, the doctor has um, the doctors actually have with their staff team. So I'm actually going to um, keep this very low, uh, a very simple from my perspective. I'm going to hand this back to you again, doctor, and I'm going to let you talk more about the clinical perspective again. And there you go. You should have uh, you should have control again. I think you're muted. There you go. You got it. Yep. Sorry about that. No, you're good. Um, yeah. So again, how can we? prevent readmissions here, um, kind of the same discussion is, is having accessibility to physicians. I mean, I know this is a telehealth discussion, but the first thing that I always tell anybody that when we go across the country is, you have to have a dedicated provider group that this is their job. If you're leveraging your own internal provider group, they have office, they have rounding in the morning, you're not going to find as much of a robust program, if you will, because this is not a dedicated group doing this work. This is an extension of your already stretched thin provider group. So I think whether having that dedicated provider group who understands and knows how to leverage telemedicine is almost your first biggest win, to be honest with you. Um, certainly again, it's having a provider group who understands how to manage acute care conditions and having the right provider group for that having the proper equipment for it as well. I mean, it's got to be easy, the equipment that you use. It's got to be scalable amongst all the country and with the nurses that you use. It cannot be something that is very cumbersome that requires a lot of intense or hands-on training with the staff. I mean, we almost all unanimously understand that, and especially in post-acute, it's almost a 20 to 30% client turnover rate. So imagine trying to have a very complex piece of equipment that, uh, requires a lot of intense training, if you will, their adaptation will be low. Certainly, again, is having, you know, on-time, real-time diagnosis, 24 set, or, you know, on-time support with the nursing staff. That's what's going to allow you to help prevent your readmissions and the coordination of care. Meaning, if you have to send somebody out to the hospital because they fell, they hit their head, they're on a blood thinner, that coordination of care with the ER doctors is very vital because we realize that ERs don't mind to send patients back to the nursing home. They just want to know who's going to be the responsible physician for that patient. Um, let's see here, do I need to, I don't know why Ronnie keeps doing that. Um, That's okay. You can just you uh, you can keep it on that slide here. I'll I'll push the slides for you, Doctor. Let me uh, right here. So this is a prime example. We had a particular facility. They're still our client, um, Glenbridge. I mean, they were at a point that the state was not happy with their return to hospitalization rates. And as you could see here, there was a a very quick and precipitous drop in their return to hospitalizations, and it was. Commonly, it's again having a telemedicine provider group that this was their primary sole focus and having the equipment to get the job done. They already had the nurses, it was the same nurses. So the hypothesis that I've always encountered across the country when I talk to acute care is all the nurses aren't trained or all the nurses aren't competent for the care. And that's just really not the case to be quite honest with you. Um, we can go to the next slide here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so we've decreased return to hospitalization. We improved their treatment place. The hospital now has basically given them premier status. They get they have the highest highest uh, bed census rate, if you will, as far as uh, occupation uh, utilization rate. Um, staff is very happy. They use it as a recruiting tool for the staff, saying you have access to doctors who aren't sleeping, don't have office in the morning, aren't yelling or any of these things, and they have improved revenue. I mean, they had a Prior to us, about an 86% occupancy rate. They now uh, have her right in the mid 90s, to be honest with you. This here is one of the, uh, the medical center, if you will. This is a hospital as well. They, they, were, they are now the number one referral source for this hospital. Increasingly, or funny enough, uh, the hospital is so intrigued by what we were doing with the nursing home that the hospital actually just now hired us as well. We just delivered our first cart to 
Otago Medical Center last, last month, actually. Um, so anytime we had to send a patient to the ER, we would do direct MD to MD communication saying, hey, Mrs. Jones fell, she hit her head, she's on a blood thinner, we'd like to get a CT of the head to rule out any potential bleeds. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Ganim, and I'll, um, I'll hand it back to, our, uh, to Joe, our moderator, and we can go from there. And I'll stop the, uh, stop the video. There we go. Yes, I'm here. <clears throat> All right, you know what? I can, uh, I can pull these up. Um, this is Ron. So, um, yeah, the first question is, is will the presentation be posted? Um, and will it be available? The answer is yes. It's a very large deck. It's like 20 something megs. I tried posting it and I had problems, but I will go back and um, I will make sure that I, uh, that I um, um, post that again. So we're good with that. One. Um, the next one is uh, um, they're interested in their experience in conducting elective encounters between SNFs and or acute rehab patients and specialists responsible for managing any of the patient's comorbidities. The alternative is putting patients in vans and driving them around town to see their specialist. The problem has been reimbursement for this care model. Do you have any thoughts on that, um, um, Dr. Ganim? You know, right now, obviously, it makes a lot of sense uh, if the reimbursement model is going to stay, certainly for specialty follow-up, especially patients who, you know, we did this in Kentucky where even prior to the reimbursement model, they were getting a lot of elective spinal cases now because of, the mo of them having telemedicine, meaning us as the primary, and then giving the specialist access to the portal. The specialist deemed it as more convenient and more efficient to just do a quick telemedicine encounter for follow-up instead of the patient even coming to the office. All right, wonderful. Um, the next question is, how are you handling the increase in requests from skilled nursing facilities that need help due to the current COVID crisis? Well, we are fortunate that we have a deep bench. Um, we have over 80, 90 providers uh, doing this work. So we had a deep bench prior to, and really it's just a matter of allocating our resources. Um, I think we've also, I wouldn't say use the word fortunate during a pandemic, but a lot of states have also loosened their regulations with regards to licensing. And so we really needed to allocate more of our internal resources to the state of New York and not all of my team was credentialed in the state of New York, but with the way New York State has allowed for providers to just instantly start practicing, it allowed us to shift, if you will, and provide more emphasis for those particular skilled nursing facilities. Um, it's again, it's all about bandwidth. Uh, the way that I view telemedicine is you have your equipment and then you have your provider bandwidth. And when you have your provider bandwidth, just like your cell phone, Verizon has bandwidth, then your call won't be dropped or your, in essence, consult won't be unanswered, if you will. Um, actually, I'll, I'll skip this other question and I'll go to one that leads on to that, but um, how are you able to cover all of these locations? Do you need additional contract and operational staff to manage the increase in interest and need? And maybe you can just give a little overview, Dr. Ganim, of your model with how Telehealth Solutions is doing it and providing that just to give people sort of a, a, a bigger picture. Sure. So uh, for us, we have our own, we've, we have an admin team of over 18 people full time. Um, we have our own onboarders. Now that buildings are under lockdown, we're just, we're using, as you know, Ron, we just send off our tablets remotely um, and we're onboarding remotely. And so uh, onboarding wise, we haven't missed a beat. We've been just doing it virtual. Um, and so that's kind of how we've been answering the current climate, if you will. And from a, uh, the current needs and the current demands is I think, you know, some, one thing that I tell clients is, uh, is when you trust an organization that has experience, meaning we've had five years of experience. So it's not like we just started this yesterday and now we're scrambling to try to make a business if you will out of this. Um, so having that experience and having that leadership allows for us to scale from also the other question is, is um, how are you, um, try to see, phrase the, the other question um, again it was a matter of having the provider bandwidth onboard recruiting or I mean onboard uh, training these organizations and that's really where we've been at okay all right wonderful and I think one of the questions we get a lot and this and, and this is what this question is specifically pointing at in a different way is 
about integrating the HPIs, the PEs, the assessment plans with the PCPs, EHRs. So in general, um, maybe not just focus on the PCPs, EHRs, but how do you sort of um, provide that patient data and, and access that so that you're sort of mimicking the workflow of the organization? Sure. So, I mean, I guess for the prominent, for the sake of this discussion, 90% um, of the market shares between Point Click Care and Sigma Care were integrated into these current homes as EHR. All of our notes go right under the progress notes section, right under telehealth. And so nothing misses a beat, if you will, with as regards to the documentation. We document everything into real time. And through our app that we have, meaning what, how the nurses get a hold of us, it's like putting a page out through to order pizza. And so when the nurses get a hold of us and we put in our note, which also goes into the EHR, that note that we put in also goes as a HIPAA compliant email to the DON, the ADON, uh, the PCP, so that when the following morning comes along, nobody missed a beat as far as what happened overnight. All right, wonderful. Um, the next question is, and I can answer this one, is any remote patient monitoring RPM um, for, some of, um, for some of these chronic pop populations? Um, um, I haven't actually seen that. Maybe you have, Dr. Ganim. Have you seen anyone just using, um, uh, you know, not where a clinician, for those of you that aren't familiar with remote patient monitor and you have, let's say, a tablet, it has uh, like a scale with it. Um, of course, they have those things inside of the skilled nursing facility itself. So I haven't actually seen RPM being used in uh, SNFs, but have you run across that in any of your um, SNFs? Certain markets who want telemetry, you know, we do it all, quite a bit in the New York market. I've seen that with the telemetry. Um, more so, we've seen the remote patient monitoring in the home setting. Exactly. You know, that's yeah. been the okay. biggest market. Okay. Um, I have a question here, um, and I can answer this one. Um, what equipment, iPhone, iPad, laptop, have you found to be most effective in doing telehealth visits with staff at the nursing home? And I think, you know, um, having done telehealth for 20 years and, and the route that telehealth has taken, there's, you know, the, the first thing you need to be able to do, right, is, and, and part of this question is you need, you need to be able to take the technology to the patient point of care. So um, you don't want to have to bring the patient in the skilled nursing facility to the telemedicine room, right? So that's why mobility is important. And that's why telehealth solution is actually using a cart. And as far as um, what equipment, I mean, we talked about the equipment earlier. For that, for them, it's really about using um, where you can have that live interaction like we're having right now, but I still have that diagnostic, um, those diagnostic capabilities with integration features um, into it as well. So I don't think it really matters. Um, they don't use iPhones. Um, iPads, I really haven't seen used as much. It just depends on the actual, um, what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, um, that, a, well, is, that's okay. If it's, you're just trying to answer the immediacy of COVID, but those are not HIPAA compliant, number one. And number two, those are not portals or tools that give you that diagnostic that we look for, meaning that pan tilt zoom camera to be able to look at somebody's, you know, legs or swelling or anything. You don't have a stethoscope, you don't have a pulse oximetry, you're really just doing video and audio at that point. So it's not, I guess, in the spirit, you can call it, intel you can call it telemedicine. But the actuality is, is it's not as comprehensive as what we, what we currently are using. Okay, wonderful. All right, um, that is, um, that actually uh, is the conclusion of all of our questions. So, um, um, Michael or Joe, did you want to close or is there anything else? No, I'll take it from here. Um, Joe, I've, I've been working with Joe in the background, her camera and her microphone all froze up on her. So she's listening and pounding on her keyboard as we speak. Um, Anyway, I'd like to thank uh, thank you both for uh, for such a great presentation. It's uh, been very informative and uh, and good questions too. Um, and a recording of this session will be available on the NTSC uh, NRTRC website uh, as soon as we can get it posted. So, uh, thank you again very much, and uh, we'll see everybody at the next uh, the next session. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Have a great day, folks. Bye bye. Bye bye.